Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is linear algebra. Today, I want to explain what is a vector space. And again, I want to motivate the definition of a vector space. Um, meaning that I kind of want to convince you that you could have invented vector spaces. And the main idea that I want to sell, and this is kind of a standard philosophy in mathematics, maybe in the sciences, maybe in, for life itself, is that you really look very hard, very long, for a very long time, you look at some examples. And maybe they are already around for a long time, you know them for a long time, whatever, something like that. And you really like them for various reasons. Because they turn up in, in, in nature, in some application, because they're pretty neat and nice and cute, whatever. Um, then you stay at them for a very long time, and you realize, ooh, those examples have something in common. Then you try to boil it down to kind of the basic principles of those examples. And you come up with an abstract definition and the examples will be examples of that abstract definition. So this is brilliant philosophy. It's a brilliant idea, it's a brilliant philosophy. It kind of, it's kind of one of the basic concepts of mathematics. It's so important that I will say it again. You take an example, you boil it down, to some basic axioms, principles, you come up with an abstract definition, and then you will see a lot of other examples of the same definition, which you can then relate, right? So then you have found a link between potentially completely different uh, parts of mathematics, science, life, whatever. Today, I will go, I'm going to explain how this works for vector space by looking at three examples and boil them down to their, uh, to their basic principles, and then, uh, then there will be the uh, formal definition of what a vector space is. Right? But keep in mind, everything is always example-based, and examples, 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 that's what you should keep in mind. So whenever you read an abstract definition, your first question should be, why do I care? In other words, what are examples of this theory? Um, for vector spaces, it's, it's probably still quite okay for most people, because you might have seen them for a long time by now, um, but you will have a lot of definitions, in particular in mathematics, not just in mathematics, but in particular in mathematics, there will be a lot of definitions where you just think, you scratch your head and you just think, why should I care? Who came up with this crap? Um, and usually it's really just people looked at examples for a long time and boiled them down. Okay, so let's get started with vector spaces. So I want to start with the first example, and I don't want to think uh, you to think about vectors because this is kind of a biased notion. We, we don't know yet what a vector space is. Okay, we just want to look at certain examples, and I want to look at the first example. I want to look at a, at a collection of arrows, and I'm going to convince you that we can scale arrows, and I'm going to convince you that we can add arrows. Right? Just, just three basic principles. A collection, we can scale, we can add. So let's have a look. A collection of arrows. Here I have an arrow called V, and it's kind of this black arrow which points in this direction. By arrow, I just mean an arrow that starts um, at, at, let's say, its origin of R2. So my, my, my ground, whatever, field, whatever you want to call it, here and everywhere in uh, will be R2. It doesn't matter so much, but I can, I can draw nicer pictures. Um, and here I have another arrow, and I call the blue one, and I call it W. And there could be other arrows. There could be pff, some green arrow going somewhere here, and you call it X or whatever. You know, you have a collection of arrows. And you realize, oh yeah, I could scale arrows. It seems to be a pretty natural geometric operation. I can scale arrows. So in, in my picture below here, for ex example, I have my, my, my arrow V and there is a scaled arrow, which is kind of half of the size, which is the red one. Or you can scale it in the other direction, like, like I did with the blue one here. Right, you, you just stretch everything by a certain scale up. Seems to be, that seems to be fine. Um, that, at least for me, seems to be a, a natural operation you would like to do on, on arrows. Um, if you think of arrows as kind of parts of a rectangle, of some rectangular shape, 
then there's another natural operation that could come up with. And this is addition of vectors. And it works like this. So I have my blue vector here, addition of vectors, addition of arrows. I have my blue arrow, uh, my, my black arrow here, and I have my, my blue arrow here. And what I do now is I just copy my blue arrow, copy paste, and I put it on top of the black arrow. And I copy my black, well, I don't need to copy my black arrow anymore, but in the same way I could copy and paste my black arrow, put it on top of the blue arrow. And I get a new arrow, which starts at the same starting point, ends where the other two end. And I've created a new arrow, which I would call, um, in this case, V plus uh, W. So that's the red one. Okay, so it's a copy paste operation. Oh, God. Um, the, if, if you know a little bit about the history behind it, it's got this um, a, a Descartes geometry, then this is a very natural operation. You probably have seen it before at one point. In any case, really the takeaway message is that we have three operations. We have a collection, uh, three basic things. We have a collection of something, whatever the something is, doesn't matter. We can scale whatever the something is, and we can add whatever the something is. So let's have a look at another example. And yeah, there will be a collection of something, like here. Um, we can scale something, as for the arrows, and we can add something. In this case, matrices. And just, just to be sure here, of course, you might know the co collect, uh, connection from matrices to, to, to those arrows, to those vectors. But a priori, that's absolutely not clear, right? I mean, if you have some collection of arrows and you have some collection of numbers in a rectangular shape, why, there should, why, why on earth should there be any relation between the two, right? And that's the whole strength of formulating an abstract definition because they both fit into the same abstract definition. Anyway, I'm ruffling. Um, so you can add uh, matrices, like you have a green matrix and you have a blue matrix, and you just uh, you can scalar multiply them by just well, you have some scalar five, and you take any entry here and multiply it by five. And you get a new you get a new green matrix. And similarly, you can whatever you minus one here, you multiply everything by minus one, and you get a new matrix. And you can also add matrices uh, entry-wise. So let me give you an example. So 4 plus 1 over 2 is, I hope, if I've done my calculation correct, it's 9 over 2. Okay. Right. So very natural operation, scaling and adding of matrices. Looks completely different than what you've seen before. But they are kind of the same types of operations. Third example, polynomials. And again, collection, you can scale, you can add. A collection, you can scale, you can add. It's the same principle. You have some polynomials, you can multiply them, you can add them. I've some, done some examples here. Um, nothing very fancy, right? You, all, you probably know how to add and multiply polynomials. The point is, Collection, scale, add. Collection, scale, add. Whatever the collection is, collection, scale, add. So if we take this philosophy of boiling it down to the basic principles, extracting the ba basic axioms, the, fundament the fundamental axioms, if you take this serious, well, then we would arrive at the following definition. Right? So a vector space, OK, there's some field involved because we have some scalars. But basically, it's a collection. It's a set. And just people like to call the elements of the set vectors. And you have two operations on them. You have a scalar multiplication and you have an addition. As you've seen it before, and you just give them some symbols. So scalar multiplication needs kind of the field. So the scalar is from the field and uh, the vector, whatever you want to multiply it is from the, from the, uh, from the vector space. Like the matrix is a matrix and you multiply it by a scalar. Um, and here you just can add two matrices. You can add two, two elements of the vector space. And then, yeah, you would write down a certain list of axioms you want to be satisfied by, again, looking 
what's going on for those examples. You certainly want, well, I just go through them briefly. I mean, it's a very natural axiom. So you certainly want some associativity. You don't want to worry about bracketing your vectors. You will realize that additions would be commutative. There should be a zero element. There should be a negative element. Um, scalar multiplication should be compatible. There should be a, a, a trivial multiplication and some distributivity laws. So it's a completely natural axioms. And these are really the, whatever, eight basic principles, uh, basic axioms underlying what I just showed you. Okay? Just go back and check them for yourself on, well, say matrices, or whatever you like. If you like arrows, check them on arrows. Uh, that's, that's a bit more for people who like to see pictures. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's the definition of a vector space. And from one point to the other, you know, oh, polynomials, matrices, and arrows are actually related. They all fit into the definition of a vector space. That's pretty amazing. And you will you will see a lot of new examples turning up. That's the whole point. You will see a lot of new examples turning up, which you haven't seen before, maybe, and which are very strange in some, some sense, and completely different from the picture I showed you before. So what is also a vector space would, for example, be two by two matrices over some, some finite field like Z mod two. So on, the only entries I allow are zero and one. That's the only thing I say. And well, one plus one is zero. And you just count. And this vector space has only 16 elements in total. This is completely different from everything you've seen before. Like for, um, for there are infinitely many vectors, right? You can just choose your favorite point and there's a vector, uh, sorry, an arrow. There are infinitely many arrows. Choose your favorite point, there will be an arrow pointing to that point. And here you only have finitely many elements. I mean, only finitely many vectors. Very surprising. Still fits into the same framework. That's amazing. That's really amazing. Um, the completely opposite kind of examples is that functions actually form, so let's say real functions from R to R, actually form a vector space. And this vector space is just huge. It's, it, it, it's, it's beyond your imagination how huge it is. I, I don't know how, how your imagination, but it's beyond my imagination. It's, it's tremendous. So, so you cannot even really write down a basis for the vector space, but it fits into the same definition. And it's just super different from at first glance, it's just super different from arrows, from matrices, from polynomials. And this is really the strength of an abstract definition. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time.